Hello and welcome to another seminar of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Today's guest is Ben Gagnon, Director of Mining and Information System at Bitfarms. Bitfarm is one of the large uh, North American and largest North American uh, miners. They uh, probably control somewhere between 1% and 2% of the total uh, Bitcoin hash rate. They operate out of uh, Quebec in Canada. And uh, Ben has uh, spent a lot of time in mining, and I thought uh, it would be good to get him and to get his experience and uh, insight onto what is happening with the mining industry in general, in terms of its evolution, as well as uh, more recent events uh, like the China ban and um, the ramifications of that. So, Ben, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Saeed, for, for having me on. Very good to be here. Um, you know, a little background about me and how I got into uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining in the first place. Uh, I found about Bitcoin back in 2010 in university. Uh, we were looking at a an internet forum where they were using it to trade files back and forth. Uh, my friend and I were looking at buying about $100 worth of Bitcoin back in the 70 cents from a friend who was mining on a GPU in his dorm room. And, you know, we we didn't know at the time how big this was going to become. And we didn't really see the the use case outside of this forum that we were involved in. So unfortunately, we decided to go buy beer instead. Um, we went to the grocery store to buy Natty Light, which was our, our college cheap beer of choice. Um, and they didn't even have that. So we ended up buying $100 worth of Natty Light. Um, it's a very, very bad choice. We watched Bitcoin go all the way up to 1200 and, and kicked ourselves the entire way. And when it came uh, What was the down, price of Bitcoin at that time? Uh, when you it was spent about 73 bucks. cents. 73 cents, yeah. And I bought I bought Natty Light instead. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't think anybody has a worse, you know, uh, FOMO story and missing out opportunity than I do. And uh, I tried to buy my first miners back when uh, Butterfly Labs was selling ASICs. Uh, they were selling ASICs back in, in you know 2013. Uh, I sent them a few thousand dollars and, and never received any miners. Uh, the next year, I went to uh, a Bitcoin ATM, picked up a few. Bitcoins at an ATM when Bitcoin's around 440. And the, the year after that, I was working for a, a web development company and my boss up and quit his job one day uh, to go and work for an Ethereum ICO called Digex. It was the first uh, ICO on the Ethereum network. And I looked at Ethereum. I said, this is, this is my chance to not buy Natty Light again. Um, <laughs> Bought, took all the money I had, bought some GPUs, uh, flew to Taiwan, set up a small GPU mine farm in my uh, girlfriend's family house, managed it remotely for a couple of months. Uh, that was working out really well. And I, I took the machines that I had and the hash rate that I had. And I started, you know, going out to high net worth individuals, family, friends, family offices in Hong Kong, selling them on this, this idea and this cash flow. Uh, that worked out really well. I moved into China, um, set up my first Bitcoin mining and Ethereum mining facility in mainland China back in 2015. Um, it was really easy to get going at the time, but by the time 2017 came around and Bitcoin price was, you know, skyrocketing from a thousand to to twenty thousand dollars, the political pressure and the corruption became immense, and I had to leave China. I went out to Hong Kong and Alberta. And I, I set up a flare gas in Bitcoin mining uh, business. And uh, I did that for about two years, trying to sell to oil and gas companies, containerized turnkey mining. And that's when Bitfarms picked me up. Uh, they saw an opportunity there to, you know, acquire my skill set, acquire my technologies, and, you know, integrate it into their operations. Uh, so they picked me up at the end of 2019. Um, or I started as you know director of mining and, and info systems, uh, made my way up the the ladder here, and now I just recently was promoted to chief mining officer. So I oversee all of our our mining operations and strategy um, going forward. So a long path to get here, but you know now sitting on top of about uh, with with Bitfarm, we're sitting on top of about one and a half to two percent of the Bitcoin network, um, and you know growing quite rapidly. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, you guys, all of your operations are in Quebec. Is that correct? Yeah. Currently, we have you know five different mining facilities in Quebec. Uh, we've got a sixth one under development, which will be ready shortly and will be fully energized uh, by the end of the month. And we're doing nice. a couple of different international expansions, but we, we started in Quebec. Yeah. So I wanted to first, before we get into the uh, big business business side of uh, mining, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, mom and pop shop uh, level of mining. So you've gone from uh, dorm room to <laughs> working at a company that is about 2% of the Bitcoin hash rate in 2021, which is a lot of hash rate. Uh, so you've experienced working at all levels. So I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on um, people, you know, people who don't work in anything related to the mining industry, um, getting a couple of uh, miners and putting them in their basement or their garage? Do you think it's a good idea? Do you think people are better off just stacking or uh, what do you think? I think everything with Bitcoin runs in the inverse of traditional industry. And mm -hmm. the, the same is true with economies of scale. So. You know, most businesses would operate in an economy of scale that looks like an end where it doesn't make sense at the small end. It makes a lot of sense as you scale up. But obviously, there's a point where the marginal return doesn't make sense and you can't continue to scale up. And, you know, your, your reward uh, does tail off. So you get this nice end shape. Bitcoin functions like a U. And the reality is, is that if you're mining at a really small scale, especially if you're in a situation where... Uh, your power costs are not your true power costs. It makes a lot of sense to mine. So, you know, this is situations like dorm rooms or condos, or you've got a, a lease where the power is attached to it, but you're not fully utilizing it. In these situations, it does make a ton of sense because you are taking advantage of an anomaly um, in the power markets. And you're also able to deploy one or two miners without any, you know, real change in your infrastructure and without any significant you know effort on your part um it does make a lot of sense and the middle end it doesn't make any sense at, at all um you know once you have to start paying for new infrastructure builds and you have to start bringing in contractors and you've got to start building up teams and you've got to have repair staff and you've got to have technicians and you've got to negotiate on power purchases and you've got to negotiate on equipment you just can't compete with someone who's at our scale. Um, and so it, it functions like a U. You know, it, it yeah. makes a lot of sense on the high end. And the, the bigger you get, the more it makes sense. Uh, on the small end, it does make a lot of sense as well. But the middle range is incredibly tough to compete. I mean, there are some exceptions to that rule. Uh, but, you know, mostly I think they fall into that category of your energy cost isn't your energy cost, you know, with, with stranded gas or with flared gas and those sort of situations, you can get up to a few hundred kW um, and it, it might make sense for you. But if you're a guy who's looking to develop a, a 500 kW, a one megawatt, a two megawatt farm, I, I think it's really, really difficult to compete and make that make sense. Yeah, I think that that that's uh, that makes a lot of sense. And of course, you know, the most important factor might just be the, uh, the the power cost. So if you're in a situation where you don't have to pay for it because you're in a dorm room, then uh, obviously that uh, makes sense. But uh, in terms of if you're running a mining business, you think you think the uh, the scale is more important than the power cost in other words if you could run a small uh, few hundred kilowatt mining business at say because you managed to get power at like 4 4 cents or 5 cents would that still not be able to compete with you guys um at a small scale you think uh you can't compete with us at that scale i mean if you're you really can't escape the power cost um, that's the one. That's the one variable that you can never get rid of, and it does drive a, the gross amount of your mining margin. is is just power costs and the efficiency of your equipment. Um, yeah. If you are trying to deal do a small a small farm, what ends up happening is you can't afford the labor to help you out, and so you end up, you know, with huge amounts of capital, huge amounts of investment, you know, and and significant cash flows. But you can't afford the labor to keep it up and you can't afford to do the repairs to keep it up and operational. And if it's not up and operational, you're not getting paid. Um, 
you know, nobody's going to do that work for you. So you end up spending countless sleepless nights doing the math. Well, you know, if I go to bed now, I'm going to lose $500 or $600 or $800 or whatever that is. Um, and you start having a lot of sleepless nights. <laughs> it really, it really doesn't bode well for you. Um, you know, you also have a huge learning curve in order to try and maintain this equipment. To run one or two miners is fairly easy. You know, to run hundreds or thousands, or, or we are tens of thousands of miners, it requires completely different, you know, infrastructure, skill set, uh, and amounts of people. So, mm-hmm. really tough. So, so, is there some power cost where you think it uh, begins to make sense, like two cents per kilowatt hour, three? You know, the the historical has always been six cents. Um, I'm I'm of the impression that long term you want to be at at three cents or below. Um, I think if you can ever deploy below three cents, you know, you should consider it. But the scale is is really a significant question. Uh, the China situation has affected that considerably. Um, you know, it's now a lot more profitable to be mining on higher and higher cost of electricity because of the drop in difficulty and the drop in network yeah. cash rate. So you can justify you know, higher electricity costs for the moment. Um, But I, you know, when it comes to infrastructure to support the mining, you know, you might take a year and a half, two years to pay that off. And by that time, you know, the network is probably going to recover. And then you're left with an asset that, you know, might not make sense, especially as we're heading into the halving. Yeah. Yeah, I think my my general impression of mining has always been that, um, uh, unless you have spe- special competence in something in that field and you're able to dedicate time into it and make it a job, then un- unless that's the case, then you're probably better off just um, doing whatever it is that you're actually good at and buying Bitcoin. Because uh, the the notion that you're just going to buy miners and um, have them run and make money. I mean, it can happen on, on a small scale, but uh, once you once it grows, you know, it requires active management, and it um, it, it has its uh, experts, and it has its uh, it's it's a highly competitive industry. You can't just waltz in and uh, expect to uh, ace everything and figure everything out. For most people, the best way to mine Bitcoin is to uh, do whatever it is that you're good at, and then just buy Bitcoin. Because um, also, you know, the thing about investing in mining is that um, there's a significant lead up if you're going to build up an operation yourself. You know, you need to start mobilizing capital now for building the miners and for building the uh, hosting facilities. And uh, that is money that you could be spending on uh, buying Bitcoin. Given how fast Bitcoin generally rises, this makes sense. Um, th- this might not make sense, you know, because you could witness Bitcoin rising 10x. And then uh, you could have just bought Bitcoin during that uh, time and you would have been better off. Uh, for, for many people, I think it makes uh, the sense. But now people are getting the option to uh, invest in mining in some other way, which is to just uh, buy stocks in miners. And we're seeing this trend growing uh, across uh, the uh, across financial markets. So what do you think this uh, growing financialization of mining and what do you think uh, it, how, how do you think it affects uh, Bitcoiners and investors and uh, the Bitcoin network? You know, it, the securitization of, of Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin miners, I think, is a really big and, and powerful concept. Uh, like most industries, you know, as they get to higher and higher scale, they require more and more amounts of capital. And in order to get cheaper costs of capital, you know, generally companies go public because it provides them greater opportunities to get more cash for less cost. Uh, and that's what it's going to take to compete in the Bitcoin mining you know, network at scale. Um, it's, it's a trend that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's why we see so many Bitcoin miners going to NASDAQ and going to the U.S. market. Um, you know, other markets are flocking to as well, but uh, the U.S. is really the primo market uh, where you're going to get the most amount of cash. And you know, markets are a very interesting concept. Um, you know, especially when we're looking at inflation, the number one area where inflation heads into first is 
is, you know, where you can buy things that are extremely liquid. And, you know, the problem of inflation is a problem of excess liquidity and no place to put it. And, and so it generally just goes into stock markets. Um, we saw last year during, uh, you know, COVID when they started ramping up, you know, uh, money printing and, and, and quantitative easing and all these sorts of financial programs, it starts flooding into the stock market here, regardless of what those companies are doing or producing, right? There's no, there's no positive change in the underlying business for the most part. Um, but this is an easy place to park cash. And, you know, if your cost of cash is, is very low, you, you put it into something that you think is a relatively safe return. And we can see the PE ratios of, of companies just blowing out to astronomical proportions. Uh, you know, when I was in college, they, they taught PE ratios of, of 12 to 14 as being a safe and average number. There are now dozens and dozens of companies where PE ratios are several hundred or, or over a thousand. And, you know, this is obviously not a, a functional and, and rational market um, to be justifying a thousand years forward earnings into the share price, right? So it's really just a function of inflation and liquidity. And I think as the markets continue to create more and more cash, you know, they're going to look for better places to put it. And how many, how overvalued can Walmart get? or Facebook get, you know, there's a limited amount of their scale and their growth, but, but Bitcoin's price is, is really just a function of how much money they print. Um, and in that way, you know, it's unlimited. So I would think that as, as inflation happens, we should be seeing, you know, all of this cash pouring into the stock market. Investors will say, where are we going to get, you know, a safer return on our investment? And it's probably going to be in the Bitcoin proxy stocks. You know, people who have Bitcoin on their balance sheet, people who are investing in Bitcoin, providing Bitcoin services, and people who are mining in Bitcoin. Um, we have a, a unique situation here with the Bitcoin publicly traded miners. If you track them, you know, the vast majority of the Bitcoin that they're mining, they're putting on their balance sheet. They're not selling it anymore. And this is a change that we've seen over the last, you know, 12 months, really, uh, before that the vast majority of those companies were selling their Bitcoin, you know, to cover their operating costs. And, you know, you really functioned as a proxy to Bitcoin mining profitability, you know, spot values. And now what we're looking at is, hey, here's a way that you can compete with like a grayscale digital trust. You know, we've got a fixed amount of Bitcoin. Uh, we've got a lower cost to produce that Bitcoin because we're producing it significantly below other companies can purchase it for on market. And it's an amount of Bitcoin that's growing every day. So if you're looking at, you know, uh, an equity-based Bitcoin proxy, do you want to invest in a fixed amount of Bitcoin and, you know, uh, an amount of Bitcoin that can only be dollar cost averaged up over time as the price increases? You want to increase your, your stack, you have to pay higher and higher prices. Or do you want to invest in a, you know, a proxy that is producing Bitcoin for significantly below market value? And adding those bitcoins to their their basis every single day, um, and in which case, if you look at it in that in that lens, you know all the bitcoin miners are going to function as like a leveraged uh, bitcoin play. So it provides a lot of investors with easy opportunity to get into mining um, and earn the same kind of you know rewards that they might be able to see by running their own operations without any of the overhead, any of the problems. Um, any of the technical knowledge or understanding and, you know, through a mechanism that they already have set up, uh, you know, whether that's their, their IRA account or their normal brokerage account or their 401k or whatever that is, you know, a, a lot of people already have this infrastructure in place uh, and it makes it really easy. So, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, um, it, it's quite uh... It's it, it's a beautiful illustration of the power of markets to allocate resources that uh, you could be considering setting up your own mining farm and you could be getting electricity in your town for like six cents, eight cents. And you think, you know, that's a good cost. I will make good money out of it. 
Um, but if you're able to invest in one of the Bitcoin miners, you know, they're able to move the miners instead of having them in your town where uh, there's a high opportunity cost because that electricity could go to the city and to the hospitals and to all the things that are needed in your town. You know, you guys, you go, you put the miners all the way out in the middle of nowhere in Canada next to uh, uh, some running water at electricity that basically has almost zero cost. And so Bitcoin mining just keeps going to where it is most uh, efficient. And even if as an investor, you know, you don't know how to go put your own miners in uh, Quebec uh, on hydroelectric power, on cheap electricity, you can uh, find it on the stock market. It's an, it's an amazing mechanism for allocating capital. And I think it's an amazing mechanism for um, discovering what you were discussing earlier, which is um, um, discovering Bitcoin as a, uh, as a superior monetary asset. You know, as you said, just how much can you overvalue uh, Walmart? You know, how much more um, valuation can you keep piling on to Walmart, which ultimately has cash receipts um, that you can compare them to. And these are in uh, in dollars and dollars and are inflating and losing value. Whereas Bitcoin companies, you know, they're just stacking more and more Bitcoin. And that's fundamentally the point that I talk about in the uh, Bitcoin standard, why it's different from other uh, forms of uh, commodities and assets, which is that no matter how much demand for it increases, the increase in the price cannot bring about an increase in the quantity. And uh, uh, the world is just continuing to find more and more creative ways of holding that money that has this property. And uh, Bitcoin is, uh, you know, the, the securitization of Bitcoin miners is one of these. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a really powerful thing. Like, it, if you look at the PE ratios, I believe the highest PE ratio in the world right now is MicroStrategy, and it's because they've accumulated so much Bitcoin, and the market understands that the price potential uh, of all those Bitcoin holdings relative to the earnings of the company, they, you know, dwarf their actual business, right? And th there's just tremendous unlimited upside potential there. Um, th I think the second one is, is probably Tesla, and you know, they had a high PE ratio even before they bought Bitcoin. And, and I think buying Bitcoin was the only thing that they've ever done to actually justify their PE ratios because, you know, now they're looking at, hey, it's not just a, a business. You actually have the, this underlying asset that's improving in value. And it, I think it's pretty telling to see a, a company like Tesla, you know, which, which doesn't have huge production volume and is not actually you know, meeting their, their production targets that instead of investing in new production facilities, you know, they invested in buying Bitcoin, you know, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to allocate capital efficiently and provide the best return. And so they couldn't have made that decision if, if they didn't think that Bitcoin would provide a better return than just producing more cars. Um, and it is probably the only thing that they've done to, to justify those high PE ratios. Yeah, um, it's it's a topic we've discussed extensively in this uh, podcast, and uh, I'm generally not the world's biggest fan of electric cars. And I think uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if really? you've, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I ultimately, I think it's you know it it is an older technology than uh, than uh, internal combustion engines, uh, but it's uh, fundamentally uh, at a disadvantage because the range of uh, internal combustion engine cars is always going to be much higher. Um, so uh, in my mind, honestly, I was kind of worried when Tesla started getting into Bitcoin because I think this is a company that would only exist in fiat. And it made no sense for them to start stacking Bitcoin very early when they're one of the biggest companies in the world because that, you know they, they might end up making electric cars for another thousand years just off of their uh, Bitcoin stash uh, if, if they start stacking seriously. But, you know, fortunately, uh, Dogecoin fixes this. <laughs> the, um, Elon Musk's uh, teenage-like attention span got distracted with uh, shiny little toys and now he's uh, busy playing all these games. I think that's probably for the better. Um, I, I, but yeah, you're right. I think it's, um, I, it, it probably makes a, um, it, it adds a serious value to their balance sheet. It's not a big amount compared to what they have, but, uh, 
the prospect that they bought it means the fact that they bought it means that there's a chance they might be buying more. So it strengthens it strengthens their balance sheet. Yeah, I think you'll see uh, you know probably more and more publicly traded companies looking to acquire Bitcoin on their balance sheet and hold it on their balance sheet just because of what that does mean for their business. You know, why do you want to keep developing your core business uh, if it's less profitable use of capital than than buying and holding on to Bitcoin? You know, you, you literally have a legal responsibility to buy Bitcoin if, if you believe that's going to provide the best return for your shareholders. Um, and so as the understanding of that continues to develop, I think you'll start seeing a lot more publicly traded companies doing that. You know, and we have seen a number of uh, publicly traded companies that were in other forms of business, you know, uh, gambling, car rentals, whatever, uh, start switching over to Bitcoin mining because, you know, their original business just can't compete with, with mining Bitcoin. Um, it it wow. provides long-term, you know, growth, long-term value, and it's going to be the best return for their shareholders they can possibly invest in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, uh, a lot of uh, fiat people think that this is a waste. You know, what are you doing? What What are all these miners doing? They're just burning all these transactions. You could do all of these transactions on PayPal. You could do them on Visa. <clears throat> You don't need to be burning all this much money. It's insane. Why do libertarians need uh, their stupid money to burn so much money? And um, the way that I think about it is um, what is being built here is a startup that is disrupting central banks. You know, this is this is like the Uber of central banking. It's disrupting what central banks do. It's like the Amazon of uh, bookshops and uh, shopping malls. It's disrupting them and it's able to offer their product with an infinitely uh, superior uh, user experience at a much better uh, cost and of course in the case of bitcoin the, the, you know that manifests itself in the fact that the supply doesn't get inflated so it has what i like to call number go up technology and so if you're investing in bitcoin if you're uh, investing in mining bitcoin or if you're holding bitcoin what you're doing is you're identifying this market need for a decentralized alternative to central banks, and you're making a market uh, uh, speculation, a market uh, action, uh, a market uh, decision that you want to allocate resources for this. And as long as people who do this continue to make positive returns, and as long as it continues to grow, then what that is saying is the market thinks this is a better, um, you know, this is eating in the central banker's share. This is eating market share from uh, central banks. And people who don't see the value in that are people who have not ever thought about money as being a market good. And this is, of course, a favorite theme of ours here in the Bitcoin Standard uh, seminars, where... The, the, almost all monetary economics that people study is just, you know, there's the central bank and the central bank decides things. And then uh, <laughs> this is how money comes about from the central bank's uh, beneficence. But uh, yeah, from the Austrian perspective, money is just a market good. And Bitcoin is the first time that we were able to put a market good, a money on the market um to compete freely with government money because this one can't be stopped by government money. And so investing in it is not, you know, it's not gambling. It's not speculation in, in the bad sense of the word. It's speculation just like any other investment is speculation in that you're putting your resources in the service of building something that is going to have a better value tomorrow. And that's what uh, Bitcoin is doing, basically. So that there's, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. I think more and more people are going to discover it. And, you know, with increasing monetary inflation, all that that's going to happen is that it's just going to emphasize this point that, that this central bank is just giving everybody money. And there's this one the, you know, everybody's lost with all of this money, and there are there's the there are these 21 million chairs out there for the planet to fight over because these are the only monetary system that is not insane. You know, the only monetary system that is not constantly leaking by creating more um, supply. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's how it's going to happen. But I'm wondering, what do you think is the value proposition for an investor? 
to get into uh, Bitcoin mining as opposed to just buying Bitcoin. So why should I go and buy stocks in a Bitcoin miner rather than Bitcoin? Is it just that it's leveraged? And is it in fact leveraged? Or does it contain more risk to the downside maybe? Well, obviously you're going to have an operator risk and a counterparty risk when it comes to Bitcoin mining that you wouldn't have if you're just buying and holding your own coins with your own private keys. Um, so that's that's always a consideration to put in there. But you know, with with risk does come reward. And the way that you have to look at Bitcoin mining specifically is uh, you have to look at your your base asset of Bitcoin and investing into the Bitcoin mining. Is it going to earn you more Bitcoin uh, over time than if you just, you know, by, by taking that Bitcoin, investing into Bitcoin miners, it's going to earn you more Bitcoin over time than just buying and holding onto your Bitcoin. And it's one of the few investments that you can make that looking over time, your, your opportunity cost is actually quite good with Bitcoin mining. You know, you can't really do that with any other industry. If you're looking at, well, you know, should I keep mining iron ore or should I invest in Bitcoin? And, you know, if I keep mining iron ore and I sell my iron ore and I buy Bitcoin over time, will I have more Bitcoin than, than if I didn't in the original, right? Um, with, with Bitcoin, we can actually measure that pretty, pretty clearly. And it's because the revenues are paid in Bitcoin, right? If you have to have an asset where the revenues are, are based in USD and you've got to trace the profitability of Bitcoin, you're chasing a, you're, it's like a dog chasing its tail. You'll never be able to keep up. Uh, if you look back on the price of Bitcoin miners over time, what people originally paid for them, what the price was in Bitcoin, and then you run the cost um, and versus the mining revenues, and you look at you know what's a reasonable uptime. Bitcoin mining is one of the few things that you can invest in and sell your Bitcoin for to actually earn more Bitcoin. Um, and, and, and that's the whole reason why we exist as an industry. You know, Bitcoin miners aren't in it because we think that we could earn more Bitcoin by just buying and holding, right? We're in it because we think we're going to get more Bitcoin by, by mining. Um, and if we set up our operations efficiently enough and low cost enough, that is, that is mathematically provable. Um, you know, it's it's not this. It's not true for everybody. Um, obviously, some people are going to lose in this game, and generally speaking, those are going to be smaller players with high costs and who have, you know, not enough time and resources to keep their miners up online running. You know, for for a low cost. So that's that's just the way that you have to look at Bitcoin mining is the opportunity cost for Bitcoin, and you know, the bigger that the the mines get, the more you know, public that they are, they become audited, they start having all these, you know, controls in place that are trying to provide investors with all these assurances against the counterparty risk, right? That, you know, hey, I'm, it's not like cloud mining, you know, eight years ago, where, you know, you had to take a risk that they were actually going to deliver your hash rate, or they're not going to cancel your contract. I mean, you know, we're audited by a big four company, we've been around for four years, we've mined over 11,000 Bitcoin uh, in North America to date. We have a predictable, provable, audited track record of performance, right? Uh, and, and that's how we try and alleviate those risks for investors. Uh, obviously, you know, newer players who are coming into the space are going to have to prove all of that out uh, because it is not the simplest thing in the world to deploy 10,000, 20,000 miners. It does require very specific engineering. It requires sourcing low-cost energy and, and good opportunities. It requires dealing with uh, regulators and, and bureaucrats, and it, it's a process, um, and that's just that's just how we have to look at it. Yeah. Now, um, in terms of uh, power sources, you guys run on hydroelectric power in Quebec, right? Yes. So, why do you guys choose hydroelectric? Well, this is something that we, as a company, did four years ago. Uh, you know, we believed, I think, from the beginning that institutions were eventually going to adopt Bitcoin and, and more specifically Bitcoin mining. And when they did come into this space, we wanted to make sure that we had all those boxes ticked for them. So, you know, when we started four years ago, we, we said we want to do, you know, all renewable electricity because we thought that was going to be important for institutional investors. Um, you know, we went with the big four auditor. We were the only one to do it at the time. We're still the only one who does it. Uh, we went through the front door with the Ontario Securities Exchange Commission instead of doing a reverse takeover. Um, you know, we, we tried to tick all the single boxes that institutional investors would need so that, you know, now 
uh, that they are starting to adopt Bitcoin and eventually they'll start to adopt Bitcoin mining more specifically uh, because it does provide those better returns um, as a lever to Bitcoin. You know, they're going to look for those players like us who, who you know, meet all their investment criteria. Um, you know, there are definitely opportunities around to, you know, invest in other sorts of electricity. Um, you know, I don't necessarily want to get into the environmental debate so much, but, you know, it, you know, the the whole notion that we as an industry are causing a problem is, is foolish. Um, you know, we're, we're 10 basis points of the entire world's electricity consumption and, and emissions output. And, you know, that's, that's really nothing. It's not a runaway problem now. And it's not a runaway problem looking into the future if you understand you know, how we produce hardware over time, how that production capacity is fixed, you know, and the halving kicks in every four years to constantly readjust the economic incentive mechanism and displace these these older, less efficient miners. So it's not, it's not even as if we can grow exponentially. I think there is a fundamental misunderstanding by the market that, that thinks that as price goes up, hash rate goes up exponentially as well. And it, it just doesn't, you know, we're subject to real world constraints. Um, and at the same time, our equipment is getting more and more efficient every single year, um, much more so and much faster so than the traditional computing industry. So it's something that's not taken into consideration uh, when people look at this. But, you know, if you do take a look at the numbers, we're not a problem. And Bitcoin is actually solving a lot of environmental problems that, you know, people have never had the ability to address before. The flare gas is a huge one. And, you know, the, the concept of a Bitcoin battery or, or a, you know, our curtailment program is really huge. Now, the vast majority of electricity out there in the world, um, or not the vast majority, but the number one use of electricity is waste. And, you know, we produce all this electricity everywhere because you always have to have an excess supply relative to demand. If, if demand ever exceeds supply, you have blackouts. And, you know, it's very, very apparent uh, when demand exceeds supply. So we're up there, we're monetizing and soaking up this excess energy capacity that exists on the grid. You know, pretty much every publicly traded miner does operate on some sort of a curtailment program. We operate on one in Quebec um, and most other miners also operate in some sort of curtailment program. So if power spikes, you know, our miners turn off. Uh, the grid will reach into our facilities, cut the power temporarily until, you know, everybody's homes have heated up, everybody's appliances have turned off. And maybe it's 15 minutes, maybe it's 30, maybe it's an hour, maybe it's a couple hours. But, you know, in no situation is somebody's home going cold because we're mining Bitcoin in Quebec, right? In fact, what we're doing is we're providing a huge economic boon to the province because if they don't, if we don't take up this electricity, They've got to push it down even further into New York, uh, lose a bunch more electricity on the way through transmission and resistance, and then they sell it to New York for half the price. So, you know, this is a an economic boon for the province. Um, if anything, they should be selling more and more electricity to Bitcoin miners because it will provide them with the most revenue for their province. Um, selling it to New York is actually the least profitable thing that they can do. And they have huge amounts of excess capacity in Quebec. Um, the situation where mining is going to be the most profitable are the areas where the infrastructure has been built up and is being underutilized. And so in Quebec, we have a situation where, you know, they built up tons of, of gigawatts worth of power for logging, for iron ore mining, for smelting, for, for paper mills, all these different things. And over time, you know, that industry has either become extremely more efficient or has been outsourced to third world countries. But the power is still there. You know, the dams are still there and nobody is utilizing it, right? So this is a, a situation where it's actually even worse because if you're, if you don't have a consumer like us, it has to go into the ground. Um, and going into the ground is, is actually not good for the environment. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, in, in order to uh, be able to give people what um, modern civilization is 
um, all about. It's 24-hour access to all the energy that you need. And really, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who have this and people who don't. And this is... This is an enormously important thing, and it's something that was built in the early part of the 20th century. You know, you could give a house 24 hours of electricity uh, maybe 100 years ago or maybe a few years before or after, a couple of decades before or after, but it's been there for a century. And it's not an impossible thing to do, and it's astonishing to see that in many places that have solved this problem many, many decades ago, and they're failing to solve this problem today, but one of the reasons in which they fail is that, you know, the, the challenge with it is that uh, demand spikes in specific periods. Um, you know, on hot days in the afternoon, everybody gets home, turns on their air conditioner, turns on the TV and um, turns on a whole bunch of other devices. And that causes a big giant spike in uh, electricity that is bigger than um, what it, the demand usually is. So in order to be able to give people a 24-hour electricity where they can just go home and not have to worry about, uh, you know, not being able to um, turn on the air conditioning or the heating and not being able to cook, and, um, you need to have a, a power plant that can provide full capacity for the highest amount of demand that you get. And that means that the majority of that plant's capacity is going to necessarily be idle for the majority of the plant's life. You know, you build, say, a 100 megawatt plant because that's the uh, maximum capacity for the area that you're uh, at. But for the majority of it, for the majority of its life, it's going to be running below 50, maybe. Um, and all of that excess uh, capacity, you know, you could utilize it. You could make good money from it if you ran it on the side in order to mine Bitcoin. This is what people don't get. They think all of the Bitcoin mining that's taking place is uh, is just all of these massively expensive electricity that's being taken away from people and driving up people's costs. But it isn't. In fact, if anything, it's bringing down people's power costs. Because if your power company, whatever energy source it's using, if it can sell part of the energy uh, of the idle capacity that it has laying around for the majority of the year, if it can sell that to the Bitcoin network, it can make a lot more profit from the Bitcoin network and it can bring your pr power prices down. Um, it, 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 it'll, it'll become more competitive. Yeah, you know, the... The peak demand thing is is a problem that we've never been able to solve before Bitcoin. And the reality is is that when you add in more intermittent sources, especially when your your base load demand is is coming from something like coal, which which can't turn on, you know, very rapidly and can't turn off very rapidly, the reality of the situation is you actually just produce more power and you can't use it, right? So a lot of this wind and a lot of the solar is producing excess power if, if the base is the base load is, is primarily coal that people can't use. You know, you actually have to have a huge gas component in there to be able to throttle down as wind and solar pick up. And that does provide, you know, a huge drain on those, on those resources and is always, is always in excess. Um, you know, where I think Bitcoin is going to be in, uh, you know, a couple of decades down the road is pretty much near every single substation. You're going to see containerized Bitcoin mines, sitting there waiting to monetize excess, you know, power on the grid, you know, for, for whatever price that is, because they have a similar situation with, with flare gas or stranded gas, you know, essentially if you can't use that energy resource, the value is zero. But if you can monetize it through Bitcoin mining, you know, and your, your base cost is zero, it's always going to be profitable, even if you have outdated old and, you know, inefficient computing hardware. And so, this is going to be kind of like a miners of last resort. I'm assuming you're going to get you're going to get people who are investing in new gen hardware. Um, they might be operating in large scale facilities, and the older scale hardware is going to cycle out, you know, and operate in these kind of you know peak demand capacities um, or, or or low demand capacities where they're able to monetize that excess instead of putting it back into the ground, and and. You know, especially when it comes to renewables like hydro, um, you know, wind and solar, not as much. Uh, but for hydro, if we're talking about investing in new hydroelectric dam, 
a lot of times your ROI is is measured in decades. You know, you're looking at a, a 30, 35 year ROI on a new hydro plant, especially if you're looking at a third world country who wants to develop this asset for providing power to their population. You know, you're going to build a power plant that's larger than you need right now in order to plan for the future. You integrate a small amount of Bitcoin mining into this plant, and you're going to drastically cut that ROI down from 30, 35 years to 15 to 20 years, you know, with, with a few percentage points of Bitcoin mining, in which case you've dramatically changed that investment, right? And you're going to attract a lot more investment uh, from a lot more different groups of people who pay the, the returns better, the risk is lower, um, you know, it should facilitate significantly greater uh, energy production and energy investment over time. And I think we're, we're at the very early stages of this. The energy companies are starting to realize that we are potentially their best customer. Because if you look at, if you look at other data centers like a Facebook or a Google, you know, they can't, they can't ever have an offline moment. Uh, instead of being able to turn off like we can, they actually have to have diesel generators as backups. Because if they ever, for half a second, weren't able to provide service to you as a customer, you know, people would be upset and start looking for alternatives. So, you know, you have to be able to tweet every second or post on Facebook every second or take your selfie and post it on Instagram every second. And, you know, all of those need to be available for everybody else to view. With Bitcoin miners, we can, there's a cost benefit, you know, for us, we can just turn off temporarily and, you know, it's not as if the Bitcoin network stops. It's not as if transactions don't get processed. Um, there's just a cost for turning off and there's necessarily a reward for, you know, turning off for that amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I think it's uh, a good way of thinking about it is that Bitcoin doesn't really compete with any of our uses because the vast majority of people pay a much higher cost of electricity than Bitcoin pays. So right. we are competing on totally different markets, effectively. Bitcoin is not going to uh, run on the electricity that is uh, connected to anybody's home unless that person happens to have extremely cheap uh, power, in which case, you know, they have a lot of excess capacity in that situation. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, a pet that you have that only eats the leftovers. You don't have to pay money to feed this pet because they'll just eat the things that you don't eat from uh, your food. And that's kind of what Bitcoin does. As you said, you know, the, the biggest single use of electricity is waste. So electricity is just not something that you can uh, conserve very easily. And so a lot of it gets lost. And it's, it's, it's not entirely accurate to call it waste because it's necessary in order to make it happen. There's no... Uh, you know, un un unless you invent a way in which that electricity doesn't get lost, then it's just part of the, uh, it it's baked into the technology. It's a feature. Uh, so you can't really call it waste because that's the only way to make it happen. But still, there are enormous quantities of that electricity, whether it's methane, flared gas, or excess capacity on uh, uh, hydroelectric dams. And all of that can be uh, monetized by Bitcoin. And the the beauty for me in the whole thing, the poetic justice of it is that, uh, and I write about this in my next book in the Fiat Standard, uh, which is coming out soon in December, and you can pre-order it from uh, safetydean.com slash TFS. Uh, the, the, the beautiful poetic justice of it is that Bitcoin growing takes away seniorage from governments and central bank and then dedicates that seniorage to anybody who has cheap electricity anywhere, gives them more money and tells them, hey, go invest in more uh, cheap electricity, make cheap electricity, make more of one of the most amazing inventions of the human race that has completely transformed our lives and that has made our lives so much better that basically nobody who has electricity who can have electricity chooses to live without it. Everybody wants to have electricity in their life who can, uh, and everybody who can uh, chooses to do so. So, um, you know, governments have spent a lot of time destroying our capacity to develop energy. You look about, you look at the uh, amount of subsidies that they give to unreliable sources of energy that are uh, ruining the grid and raising power prices all over the world. Uh, wherever they implement these programs. And Bitcoin is like the Robin Hood of the energy market. It takes from the government, uh, it takes seniorage from the government, and then it gives it 
to the producers of cheap, reliable electricity, because that's really what Bitcoin needs. Bitcoin needs cheap electricity and also reliable electricity. And so it gives the people who produce cheap and reliable electricity more resources in order to make more and more of it. And I think that's just amazing. It's a global a bounty for the development of cheap uh, electricity, which I think, you know, we're only at the beginning of it, but imagine another 10 years of Bitcoin and then imagine how much mining grows and then imagine how much cheap electricity is going to be financed through investment in Bitcoin mining. And then think about the implications for people all over the world that uh, that, that are going to be able to get more and cheaper electricity because of it. It's It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, it, it's an economic boon for everybody. And, you know, having more stable electric grid at lower prices, I mean, that benefits every single person on that electric grid, right? Whether they're a, a residential customer or a business customer, um, or, or they're the actual electric, electricity producer themselves. I would think that also, you know, the, the publicly traded miners have the greatest ability to convert that, you know, that, that central bank printing press directly into Bitcoin, because what is going to happen is you're you're going to have direct input basically from the Federal Reserve into investors, into the stock market. And there's only a limited amount of places where you can allocate that capital. Um, you know, we have a fixed amount of Bitcoin mining machines that can be produced every single month. Um, the lead times on miners are, are long. Uh, historically, they've been about six to eight months. Now they're 12 months plus. Um, you know, the situation with China has changed that a little bit, but, you know, the chip shortage is the chip shortage. And if you look at the new payment times and the payment terms with, you know, foundries like TSMC or Samsung, they've gone from three to four months out to 12 months, right? And so for us to change our supply lines, it, it takes over a year. Um, an increased amount of capital thrown at the industry does not increase the amount of miners produced, um, in which case... What do you start doing with all this capital that's being thrown at Bitcoin miners? You know, they probably start doing the Michael Saylor approach and just buying Bitcoin. Because if you can't buy more Bitcoin mining machines and you can't invest in more infrastructure, you know, what else are you going to do? What else is a better return on your capital? You're not going to hold on to cash when we know that cash is uh, earning at basically a negative yield. You're going to invest into Bitcoin. And so we're going to be a very, very efficient mechanism for taking central bank printing presses and, and running it directly into uh, the Bitcoin system in a way that, you know, private entities just never could do. And, and entrepreneurs, you know, seven, eight years ago could never do. When I started my Bitcoin mining company, you know, six years ago, it's not as if we had access to bank funds or, or anything like that. Um, everything had to be bootstrapped with your own personal cash, family and friends or investors. And now, you know, the markets are going to do that for us. And it's going to be up to us in order to allocate that capital efficiently. And it's if Bitcoin's your best return. That's where it's going to go. Um, so we're going to have a, a massive ability to do that. And, you know, if you look at stock markets around the world and you want to look at absolute yield, uh, the places where they have the best yields are the places where inflation is happening the most. You know, like the Caracas stock market is, is the best performing stock market, I think, globally. And it's not because those businesses are incredible. You know, it's not because they're producing no. more goods at great prices. It's just it's just a matter of the printing press going directly into the equity markets. Um, and in the U.S., we have the largest printing press in the world and the largest equity market. So it is able to absorb a larger printing press. But, you know, there are limits to all of these things. And I think that's primarily what's driven up the FANG stocks, you know, uh, more so than, than everything else, because people think they have higher scalability and you can continuously throw more cash at them. But there are only so many users of these products in the world. They can only be on your services so many hours in a day. You know, you can't, you can't scale up more than the global population and you can't scale up more than 24 hours in a day. And you know, there are limits to all of these different things, whereas Bitcoin is, is truly unlimited in that, in that potential. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm wondering, uh, what do you think of uh, the possibility of mining with uh, intermittent energy sources like wind and solar? Do you think this is something that's sustainable or is it likely that it'll only survive at this stage because um, these things are subsidized? Uh, do you see a way in which it can uh, be run profitably, sustainably? 
Well, I mean, it is profitable right now because of the subsidies. Uh, you can get solar power right now for, for three cents or under, which is globally competitive. You know, the the time when the solar is not plugged in, you have to be tied into the grid. Um, but this is all a, a balancing mechanism. One of the things with the intermittent power sources is that they generally have a, a power purchase agreement with the utility. You know, if they produce more power than they're allowed to sell, that goes into the ground. And if you have inefficient miners or, or older cheap miners, it becomes really easy to monetize that, you know, when your base energy cost is, is essentially zero because you have no other ability to sell it. So with the intermittent power sources, it doesn't make sense to deploy, you know, brand new, very expensive equipment, but it will become a, a ground for all this older equipment to have a second life um, and provide better returns for that utility. You know, it's going to be where the S9s go. Um, and in the future, it's going to be five years, six years down the road, it's going to be full of S19Js. Because what you want with an intermittent power resource is you want to be able to monetize the power for the lowest amount of cost, which means you want the lowest capex, and you want to minimize your opportunity cost from being down. If you have the, the newest equipment that's producing the highest cash flows, it becomes very expensive to be offline. But if you've got very cheap old equipment with not very you know high cash flows, the cost of being offline is not so great. And the cost to monetize that you know otherwise would be wasted resources very low. And so you're going to see you know all the older equipment recycled out, I think, into these kind of scenarios. Um, and it will be primarily financed by subsidies. It's the only way that solar gets down to that cost is is through subsidies. And the same thing with wind. Um, you know, they have significant challenges there with those investment, you know, vehicles because even though they're classified as sustainable resources, you know, you need to replace the solar panels and the windmills after 20 years. Um, they're not permanently running. It's not as if we put up a windmill and it just runs indefinitely for, for the rest of time. Yeah, and putting it up and uh, replacing it is no joke. You know, it's not uh, it's, it's not like disposing of an engine. The windmills are enormous and the solar panels take up a lot of space. Absolutely. The, the windmills are already being reproved uh, replaced after 10 years instead of the 20 years that they're supposed to be done on because, you know, people like Warren Buffett say, well, I can get, you know, cheap financing and I can get subsidies to upgrade these windmills. And, you know, even though it's not at its useful time span, I'm going to do it now because the subsidies make it cost effective to do so, which means that we have windmill blades piling up all over uh, the world because there's nothing that you can do with these things. Um, they're yeah. all fiberglass. They can't be recycled. They can't be transported easily. Um, they can't really be broken down into new materials so effectively, at least with, with current technology. So, you know, in that way, it's yeah. not and very... Uh, I, I should, I should, yeah, and of course, we should add that everything along the life cycle of this uh, windmill turbine is done with uh, hydrocarbons. You know, you, you can't manufacture wind turbines on wind energy, you need to make gigantic fires and um, have probably coal plants or gas or, uh, and you need, and, and the, the turbines themselves are made from, uh, um, from petroleum byproducts. And then transporting them, of course, cannot be done on, uh, on anything but machines that run on hydrocarbons. And then disposing them, of course, also requires the same. So the whole thing is an elaborate, I exercise what I like to call hydrocarbon washing, where we spend yeah. a lot of hydrocar hydrocarbons in order to build this extremely complicated contraption that hooks up to our uh, machines and then lets us for a few minutes every day or a few hours every day, pretend like hydrocarbons didn't go into um, doing what we're doing right now. But in reality, you know, of course, it's not just the uh, windmills, it's also the entire grid and all the cables and wires that go into making it none of that would be possible without hydrocarbons we can't make that out of twigs and we can't dig metals uh, without uh, at scale at this cost in order to be able to produce it without uh, hydrocarbons so yeah um <laughs> we are, we're big hydrocarbon enthusiasts here at uh, this seminar <laughs> absolutely i mean there's really only two truly sustainable resources as far as i'm concerned for power and it's, it's hydrothermal or it's, it's hydropower and geothermal um, 
you know, those are the only two assets that you can really produce that just continuously generate power for decades and decades, if not 100 plus years. Um, everything else is is literally a fraction of the lifespan. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So next thing we wanted to talk about is the China ban. What was your uh, what is your impression of what has been going on? Um, in terms of there, what is the, your insight from the mining industry on uh, what the effects of the China ban are? Well, I, you know, it's pretty clear that the China ban is not anything to do with with the environment or or emissions, um, but everything to do with capital controls and, and financial controls over over their population. Um, you know, looking at what that means for other miners, it's it's a huge boon for us because the the peak network hash rate, you know, which is estimated, was estimated at 198 exahash on, I believe, April 15th of this year. And, you know, currently it's around 8990 exahash. And that's more than a 50% drop in, in peak hash rate. And that just means that everybody who else is installed and operating, their, their market share has effectively doubled, um, which means we're making twice as much Bitcoin for the same amount of cost. Uh, it's a huge, huge boon for all of us. And Running the math is is quite startling. Uh, you know, we drop from 198 to 89. It's 109 exahash. Uh, you can reverse the math out using the watt per terahash efficiency of the miners. And you know, if you were talking about new gen miners, which we're not, um, it would be something like 1.2 million machines with a 40 watt per terahash average. Um, on the high end, it would be 100 watt per terahash, which is like an old S9 and A10s. Um, and that would be 7.8 million machines. Realistically, the number is probably somewhere between 60 and 80. So we're somewhere between 6.5 to 8.7 gigawatts worth of, of power taken offline in China and you know, 2.2 and 4.3 million machines. This is, this is a huge amount of infrastructure that just came offline. And China is by far the world's number one electricity producer and consumer. Uh, the U.S. second. Um, I believe Canada third, but you know we don't have this kind of infrastructure anywhere else in the world, and no other country operates at Chinese speed. So, for these miners to find a new location and a new home is going to take years. Um, and at the same time, we're still producing roughly a hundred thousand new miners every single month, based on production schedules and, and payments to the foundries that have been done, you know, for the last six, seven, eight months. Um, laying the groundwork for this going forward. So it's a huge amount of infrastructure that cannot be deployed. Um, obviously, there's going to be a big rush to develop new electrical resources, new substations, and that sort of thing now, um, and, and transfer all of this over to, to Western countries. But what takes 8 to 12 weeks in China is going to take 8 to 12 months in the U.S. And that's that's just a reality of, of you know, how fast things move in China versus how fast things move in the U.S. Um, so for everybody who's, who's sitting here operational with machines now, this is higher profitability now and for a long time looking forward. Yeah. Um, do you have some guess as to when the hash rate will recover? Yeah, you know, we were on the verge of 200. We're probably around 93 today. Like looking at it over the last... Uh, Looking at the daily estimates over the last week or so, we've kind of bottomed and we've been flat around the range of 80 to 100 um, tera million, 80 to 100 million terahash per uh, second. Um, in this case, do you think we've bottomed? And how long do you think it might take until we can hit 200? No, it's, it's anybody's guess how much rack infrastructure is actually available and ready right now. But I'd, I'd say it's incredibly small. Um, the prices of hosting have been creeping up rather rapidly with the China situation. The demand for hosting is significantly increased. Um, realistically, I'm thinking this is probably going to be 12 to 18 months before we're at our previous all-time high again. And this will largely function as a result of completely new infrastructure developments. Uh, some electrical or some minor upgrades, you know, converting from older hardware to newer hardware, increasing the hash rate with the same amount of power. Um, but this is 
this is going to take a while for the market to adjust. Uh, as of right now, you've got a lot of miners who, you know, have already put their miners in containers and on boats shipped off to the U.S., but they don't have a place to plug them in. And, you know, they might sit in storage for, for months at a time while they work on these deals. And the Chinese have come to the U.S. and Canada before um, in the last bull run of 2017. And they quickly left because they realized they couldn't just drive up to a power plant on a bus, you know, have a couple of drinks, shake a couple of hands and have a deal signed. You know, um, it's, it's something that they learned the hard way. And they're going to need to find trusted counterparts uh, to work with them and navigate the bureaucracy and the rules here and help develop that this infrastructure. It's a completely different way of doing business than in China. And it's not something that they're used to at all. Um, but the reality is, is that the economics are there to justify them paying more than they've ever been used to paying. And they're in a bit of a rock and a hard place between, you know, paying for this this equipment or having already paid for this equipment and not being able to monetize it. So they'll start to get creative. Um, I think what we'll see over the next two years is maybe a lot of temporary installations that take advantage of things that they can develop quickly, even if there are higher costs of electricity per kilowatt hour. Um, probably a lot of containerized deployments uh, that can get everything monetized faster. And as they develop cheaper resources, they can move the infrastructure easier with less cost. Yeah. All right. Well, Peter has a question for you. Uh, Peter, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ben. That was absolutely fascinating. My question relates to the China ban and the possibility of something similar with mining happening in Canada. Uh, in your answers, you were quite explicit that Bitcoin competes against the legacy financial system. And you were saying that we, we've seen, you, you were also quite confident, it seemed, that what's happened in China will not be happening in the markets in which you operate. So I just wanted to get a sense of why it is that you, you think that places like Canada are more prone to protect investments in mining, uh, especially given that from what we can see uh, internationally, it seems like Canada's quite um, has taken quite a few reasonably heavy-handed policies, uh, particularly during the COVID era, uh, to clamp down on things it doesn't like. So why is it that you think that Canada's a stable environment for, for mining going forward? Well, well and, and I think this is true for both Canada and the US, but it goes back to what I was saying earlier about how we've developed all this infrastructure here in Quebec to facilitate old industry. And this industry has largely moved on to third world countries um, or, or become extremely more energy efficient. But those resources are still there. Nobody's investing in these areas. Um, if you look at, you know, in the U.S., uh, places like former Alcoa plants in Messina, uh, New York, where Coinman is, you know, here's a huge amount of, of power up there on the border with Canada and upstate New York uh, at a former Alcoa plant that's been shut down and moved overseas. And, you know, that entire town has been gutted economically. Nobody has reinvested in that town since Alcoa left. You go on Zillow right now and you can find houses there for $10,000, $20,000. Um, I mean, this is obviously a town that nobody else has been interested in other than Bitcoin miners. And so, you know, when you look at what governments are interested in, I, I think it's primarily jobs and tax revenue. And we're, as an, we are as an industry, investing in areas and, you know, taking advantage and monetizing resources that nobody else is interested in. Um, in which case, we're an economic boon to all these different populations. And so I think you're going to have a struggle between local governments and, and federal governments. You know, obviously, the local governments are going to receive the, the most benefit from having their local populations employed um, and their local assets generating productive returns. Um, and being reinvested in those communities, while the federal governments are going to be the ones that feel, you know, potentially more threatened as, as to what Bitcoin does, you know, to their own currencies. At the same time, you know, if you're looking for uh, basically a sponge to absorb all that liquidity, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, that we are the sponge. 
that absorbs all this excess liquidity that they're pumping into the market. You know, you can't you can't find other industries that can just absorb all the inflation and all the money printing that they're going to do. Um, so in which case we, we kind of are that buyer of last resort of their liquidity, um, in which case they can extend this behavior significantly longer than they would be otherwise. And I think Venezuela provides a, an interesting example on that. You know, I don't know if that regime would still be there if there weren't Bitcoin miners operating that country generating positive yields and, you know, productive assets that the population could actually be trading in, going over across the border, buying goods, buying food, you know, buying products and then bringing back into the country. Um, it simply doesn't make sense if you're in Venezuela to be working for boulevards, um, but it does make a lot of sense to be working for Bitcoin. And if you are earning in Bitcoin, I think that provides uh, a much higher quality of life. And it reduces the pressure on the government in order to provide all those services and the needs for their population. So in that way, it kind of enables them to keep doing what they're doing for longer. But can you apply that same logic to China as well? That if they're interested in jobs and tax revenue, then they want to have these industries near to them rather than in other countries. Well, I think that's, primarily what drove all the investment in China in the first place. You know, the China followed like a field of dreams approach when it comes to developing infrastructure. And they developed infrastructure in locations where there was really no demand for that infrastructure because they have a, a system of government that encouraged, you know, developing these different assets, you know, in different provinces. You look at how many people are in the, uh, the Politburo, which is the the top ruling class of the Communist Party is about 250 people, and over half of them have degrees in hydroelectric engineering. So, you know, where are they going to allocate their, their tax revenues? They allocate them into hydroelectric dams because it's what they know that they're going to be able to get passed and supported. But they start developing these resources in places like Sichuan, where there's no industry and there's no demand, right? All mm. the demand is on the East Coast, where all the manufacturing takes place. And in order to bring that electricity from Sichuan over there requires ultra high voltage transmission lines I mean, technology that literally the Chinese had to invent so that they could economically move that electricity from the location where they developed the resource to the location that actually demands it. Whereas Bitcoin came in there and provided a boon, you know, these people could work in their local areas, they could generate uh, tax revenues in their local areas, they could reinvest in the economic development of those local areas in ways that nobody else is going to do. It's not as if, you know, companies wanted to make cars in Sichuan, um, you know, but but everybody wanted to make Bitcoin there, right? And we'll, we'll see what happens with China over the long term. Uh, you know, a lot of Chinese are wondering and hoping uh, that they reverse their policy uh, and, and restore this, this industry back. It's way too early to tell what's going to happen there. Um, and China can... Uh, move in a very, very fast way. You know, they can, with this last ban, it, it happened over the course of about four days. And if they wanted to reverse that, they could easily do that in four days. Um, and it would take a couple of weeks for them to build back up the infrastructure, but they could certainly do it faster in China than we could build so in the West. Um, and they might realize that this is a boon for them, but I think their, their goals are more on control. Um, as opposed to job creation and GDP, it's China has a lot of ways that they can, you know, pump up those numbers. Um, they have their own number go up technology when it comes to GDP. Uh, and, and I think they'll utilize that first. Yeah, I think uh, perhaps the, uh, the key thing is that in China, the reason that they did clamp down was because of capital uh, controls. And that's that's a serious issue in China. You know, if, uh, people who go do business in China are usually getting propositioned to smuggle capital um, because it's a huge uh, issue. So you can see why Bitcoin would be quite sensitive and become a problem once it grows beyond uh, a certain point. Um, you can see how it can undermine uh, the financial control that uh, the political party there enjoys, the CCP. 
um, it's not clear that that is the situation in uh, most other countries, at least not yet. You know, we're not at the point where you have capital controls. We're not at the point where they're confiscating people's bank accounts. And um, I mean, well, some would argue we're getting there, but I think it's still a long way to go before... Uh, well, who knows how long, in fact, this things can move very quickly, as we saw last year with the coronavirus. But uh, perhaps it'll have to be, uh, if there is going to be something like that happening in the West, it's going to come uh, when these countries start to move against uh, uh, freedom of capital, basically, freedom of movement of uh, capital. Yeah, and we have uh, historical evidence of, of Bitcoin restrictions being a form of capital control. If you look back in 2017, um, China implemented a, a policy where you know, they restricted withdrawing Bitcoin from Bitcoin exchanges. And you know, they still allowed you to transfer your RMB to the exchange and buy Bitcoin, but you'd have to sell the Bitcoin on the exchange and withdraw your RMB. You weren't allowed to withdraw the Bitcoin anymore. Before that, you were freely allowed to move your RMB there, buy Bitcoin, send the Bitcoin abroad and, and sell it for whatever currency you wanted to do. Now, obviously, you know, they're not a big fan of that situation because of their strict capital controls of, of about 50,000 USD leaving the country per year per person. Um, you know, what they did when they implemented that policy, though, was they didn't implement it for all cryptos. They just implemented it for the number one, Bitcoin. And immediately, you start seeing Ethereum's price rally from $10 to $430. Now, the rest of the West is saying, well, this is because Ethereum works and ICOs are the future. But the reality is, this is really just a capital control mechanism implemented in China. And the Chinese still wanted to perform the same function. And so they bought the number two. And it drove the value of Ethereum up from $10 to about $430. Um, and most of the West doesn't understand that because they don't understand China and they don't speak Chinese and they're not following Chinese news. But uh, to those of us who were operating in China at the time, and this was a pretty clear situation. Uh, interesting. I did not know that. Um, one one more question. Um, we're running a little bit uh, uh, into our uh, scheduled time, but I wanted to get your thoughts on um, Bitcoin mining equipment and the centralization of its production. First of all, do you think the uh, um, manufacturing has been decentralizing over the past few years, as most people would think? And how do you see it uh, playing out in the future? Do you see forces for centralization of the production of miners, or do you think over time we're going to witness more decentralization? You know, I, I think we have two different incentives happening at the same time and um, kind of competing against each other. I do think that there's going to be greater, greater centralization in terms that there's going to be larger and larger scale miners. At the same time, because of that economy U of scale um, or economy of scale shaped like a U, you know, I think we're going to increasingly incentivize smaller mom and pop people for running one or two miners um, and for smaller companies. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have I should have specified. I meant the production of uh, the, the mining equipment, not the mining itself. Well, the production of the mining hardware? Yes. Uh, I think that's been increasingly decentralized over time. Um, you know, when we when we first started, it was really just Canon producing, you know, equipment and and Every single time there's a bull run, there's a bunch of new miners who are trying to come into the space and they say, look, we can produce a you know better or similar quality of chip for a lower price. And we're going to take a lower price on our hardware because we don't have the, the operational and the reputational history that the, the bigger players have. Um, it's something that we see now um, as Bitcoin was going up to 60K, a ton of new entrants were getting into the market and saying, you know, this is a great time for us to produce our chips and produce our new hardware and sell them to customers. So I, I think we'll continue to see more and more players. I doubt that there'll just be one or two mining manufacturers in the future. Uh, you know, the hardware is a commodity and anybody can produce that with the right skill set and the right connections to the foundries. Uh, I, I think that you're going to have more and more companies do that. And I also think you're going to have more traditional computing companies start getting into the space 
you know, companies like Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, they're going to start to realize that, you know, this is, this is a really good business for them to enter into. Um, it's a great use of their existing resources, technologies, you know, stack um, and experience. Why do you want to develop a chip that you have to market and sell to consumers when you can develop a chip that just has a predictable cash flow attached to it? And if it does have a predictable cash flow attached to it, you know, then there's a, a very easy way to price that chip. Um, everything else that they do now is, is a marketing game. Um, you know, for Intel CPUs or for GPUs, it's all marketing. Um, I think you're going to see a huge demand for that. Yeah, it, it is honestly curious for me that they haven't uh, moved uh, uh, quicker into it. And um, it's curious that the majority of uh, mining manufacturers are in China. Now, what do you think, is uh, when, when you say decentralized, do you think that that will also change over time, that we're going to start getting more non-Chinese manufacturers? Or is there some reason that continues to make sure that uh, they have an advantage? I think they're going to see North American manufacturers emerge. Um, in the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I guess so. Um, a lot of people think of this as, uh, you know, they think that the bigger the companies that get into Bitcoin, then the uh, more insecurity uh, or the more attack uh, angles this uh, creates. I tend to have the opposite view. I think the more institutionalized and the larger the Bitcoin becomes, the first of all, there's the political aspect of you know you have more people with serious money who are invested in Bitcoin, and so more politically influential people are able to sway political decision making in favor of Bitcoin. But also, I think uh, in general, this is uh, my uh, the result of my understanding of capitalism. You want to trust yourself, and in fact, you do this. Most people don't like to think of it that way, but you're constantly trusting yourself and your life and your work and your wealth to things that are produced uh, through the magic of reliable long, long uh, supply chains. You know, uh, the division of labor and the people who are specialized in doing what they do. This is what makes anything work. And you know, we use a lot of complicated machinery every day. Um, and the way that that complicated machinery can be done reliably, um, the, the way that it can be produced reliably is when you have large companies and large supply chains, you know, you have a producer who just makes one tiny little part of your laptop in one country, and then it gets shipped into another country where it, they add other stuff and then it gets assembled somewhere else. So many different parts come together from many different places in order to make your computer or your car happen. And when you have that degree of specialization, you each participant is producing each thing that they're doing many times and with such a degree of um, repetition. They accumulate the capital for it, they increase their productivity and they're able to um, they're able to do it very, very reliably. And for me, this is the safest thing. You know, this is why um, technology is safe because you have these long supply chains where everybody is extremely specialized in what they do. And I think introducing this into Bitcoin mining and having more and larger and more professional companies and more diverse supply chains is, I think, going to be a net win in the long run. Yeah, I think we have a, a geopolitical issue with supply chains that you know people don't fully comprehend. Um, you know, I have a feeling that we're living in Atlas Shrugged, uh, where the infrastructure is continuously breaking down, and things that you expect to be functioning normally just stop functioning normally. It seems like every day I'm reading about a plane falling out of the sky, um, which is just something that you wouldn't have heard before, um, or you know, infrastructure exploding or collapsing. Uh, this is something that I think is going to happen more and more. And as infrastructure falls apart, so will supply chains. Um, we're going to need to have, I think people are going to need to think seriously about their supply chains and how this works. Fortunately, with Bitcoin, you know, at least our miners are very, very simple products. Um, besides the chips themselves, we don't use anything that's a, a rare resource or a difficult to produce, you know, component. Um, we've got PCBs which can be manufactured anywhere. Uh, we've got things like capacitors, which can be manufactured anywhere and for, for almost zero cost. 
computer fans, aluminum shells. I mean, the vast majority of the technology and components in a miner are, are, are produced all over the world already and are incredibly simplified. Uh, it's only the chip production, which is entirely concentrated in a few places. And, you know, I think even TSMC understands this. TSMC is the number one producer of chips in the world. But if you look at where they are investing in their new production capacity, you know, they're not investing down in, in, in Taiwan. And I think it's it's a geopolitical move uh, against China coming in eventually and, and taking over Taiwan, um, or at least the threat of, of that happening. Instead, they're going to invest in the U.S. where they can keep that technology safe, um, which will provide a, a net benefit for, for miners in the U.S. and Canada. You know, otherwise, that, that potential supply chain for all Bitcoin mining equipment is, is threatened. Um, you know, if there is a breakdown in, in international relations. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, that's a that's a good point. Uh, but again, um, a, a, as the industry continues to grow, I think hopefully, I would expect we're going to see just more diversification and more uh, big players enter the market, and uh, each one of them will become less and less significant. My right. m my my estimate is that I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where we're going to have somebody as powerful as Bitmain was in 2017, because at that point they produced something like 90% of the hash rate. And uh, they chose to use that in the most, uh, in, 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 in the best way <laughs> to illustrate the lesson that miners can't control Bitcoin. Um, and it was an extremely expensive mistake for them. At, uh, you know, they, they were on the verge of IPOing and then their IPO was canceled. And, uh, you know, they, they missed out possibly on 100 fold growth. Um, if you think about the potential that they had, if they had, uh, instead of mining Bcash, instead of spending so much time um, trying to defend that uh, doomed fork, if they had uh, focused on just making more miners and uh, stacking more sats, uh, they'd have probably done a lot better for themselves. So I think, you know, the, to end on a positive note is... Um, we're highly unlikely to be in a situation where somebody is going to be more powerful than what, than Bitmain at that point. Mm -hmm. And even if we do, you know, we saw the worst that Bitmain could do is uh, ruin their own uh, profitability and the, the CEO got uh, fired and uh, it ended badly for them. The, the block size war is... Uh, is is is, is uh, uh, an an excellent source of lessons about the power dynamics of Bitcoin. Absolutely, I, that was a probably the biggest test of anti fragility to date. I, I do think that China's ban of Bitcoin mining is an even greater example of Bitcoin's anti fragility. Uh, here's what happens when you know a country comes in and and completely shuts down an industry overnight, and and nothing happens to the network in terms of production, transactions, everybody's still going through, everything's still processing exactly as intended. Um, it would be incredibly difficult for, you know, other countries around the world to produce the same sort of legislation and regulation, you know, and also do so concurrently in a way that actually threatens the network. So Bitcoin being shut down in China, I think, is a general boon. Uh, those miners are going to be pushed to all sorts of different jurisdictions jurisdictions and locations that they've ever thought of before and never even considered before. So in that way, you know, we're getting a, a huge diversification geopolitically of the mining infrastructure all over the world. Um, and I think that's that's good for the security of the network. I think that's also good economically for all these different regions. The last thing I think you want to be is a country that has zero Bitcoin mining, you know, happening in your country. If you don't have that, it's going to be very, very hard to generate returns in the long term, I think. Um, you're going to need to have a consistent cash flow of Bitcoins in your country. Otherwise, you're always going to have to be printing more cash to get more Bitcoin. Um, and it's a, it's a losing game. Um, you know, I, 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 th I think you're probably correct on this, perhaps in, in, in uh, this kind of transition period. But I think in the long run, maybe I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on this. Um, I think, you know, my example that I like to give is Switzerland was uh, 
the place the, the place that had the most gold per capita it had the best banks in the world and everybody in the world used to send their money to switzerland because their banking system was backed by gold and so they had tons and tons and tons of gold and yet they had zero gold mining there was nobody mining gold in switzerland on the other hand uh, very poor countries in africa uh, were mining a lot of gold, but it was all uh, leaving their shores and going into uh, Switzerland. I guess in the long run, I'm not so sure that there's going to be that much um, political and economic uh, importance and significance for Bitcoin mining. Although I can see why it would be the case perhaps now, because uh, Bitcoin mining allows you to acquire um, you know, if you do it properly, if you can uh, run it uh, profitably, you can uh, max out uh, and increase the amount of Bitcoin that you can accumulate. And then, uh, particularly for a country that uh, does this to use its spare capacity and spare energy, it can be massively uh, profitable. You know, you could probably um, cancel your national debt, perhaps, by doing something like this. But uh, maybe in the long run, you know, Bitcoin mining ends up being just another utility. It becomes like plumbing. You know, nobody, uh, nobody cares. Plumbing is really important, but you know, the people who make uh, pipes for plumbing, um, that doesn't give them any kind of extra strategic uh, leverage uh, over humanity because they make our pipes. They make our pipes because they currently happen to make them at the lowest uh, price for us. But if they start uh, <laughs> messing around, we can easily get new pipes from somebody else. Yeah, I think, you know, definitely right in terms of, of gold and, and the centralization there. And I think with the securitization of, of Bitcoin miners and the securitization of Bitcoin, you will see a, a huge, you know, centralization there in the financial markets. Um, the difference with gold is is really just the barriers to entry where, you know, I, you know, there is the low end of things where you can go gold panning in a river with, you know, anybody can do that for a low cost. But you know, pretty much all of those gold resources are developed and, and gone. If you want to start mining gold and, you know, actually mining gold, you have to do a huge, big open mine. It requires huge amounts of CapEx, resources, permits, government support, all these different things. You know, to get started mining as a Bitcoin miner, you need a couple hundred bucks, a little bit of internet, uh, a little bit of power and an internet connection, which really levels the playing field. You know, you don't actually have to find the gold resources and develop them economically you're oftentimes you're taking advantage of, of, of improperly priced electricity um, or maybe just using as a hedge against you know your inflation as, as they're doing in in Venezuela so uh, it is it is a slightly different thing um, definitely there is going to be centralization I think in the financial markets just because of that's where the capital goes first and that's that's the big thing driving Bitcoin is is just the issuance of new capital. Um, I, I think as the capital markets understand and as investors understand that there's going to be huge pressure to uh, put more and more Bitcoin on your balance sheet and and ideally more and more hash rate on your balance sheet because it's a lower cost way of accumulating Bitcoin over time. So in that way, I think we'll see huge amounts of centralization for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Ben. This was uh, very fascinating and informative. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, a pleasure. All right. Have a good day. Take care. You too.